Okay, good afternoon. I think we'll get started. Uh, apparently, there's going to be a request for you to fill out an evaluation at the end of the uh, the class, and the uh, materials have been set up front. So, so please don't uh, just get up and run away. Uh, please take the time to fill out the evaluations because I know the instructors will appreciate that. So, any questions about last time before we get started with this time? As all know, all you wanted to know and more about vitamins, right? <sighs> Good. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. So I did like blacklight. Did you? Just, yeah. <laughs> see, see. Most most of the stuff I say is true. You know. Yeah. And if you want to buy the book that tells you what I say is true and what is not true, I I have that for sale as well. Okay. So today we're going to talk about mineral analysis. And so uh, to begin with. The question is, why would we bother? Why would we bother to analyze the minerals in food? So what would be your response if I were to come up and, uh, or, or more to get back to the example I gave last time, if your grandmother came up to you and said, well, why are you doing this? Why are you bothering to learn about how to analyze minerals? What would you say to her? Could be your grandfather too. <laughs> so you're looking at me like you're thinking, about answering. Yeah. Those minerals uh, are really small things that help biological functions, but like particularly some are used in like enzymatic reactions. Okay. Well, that's a good explanation. Explanation for what they do. Okay. But like, who cares? <laughs> you know why as food scientists as people that would be responsible if you worked for a food company to measure them why would you bother yes okay so the nutrition label the facts a panel that you have come to know and love right and also to know uh something about adequacy uh, are the foods providing, um, and it's where it says minerals, just have in your mind, whenever it says minerals, we're talking about essential minerals because there are minerals that are not essential. For example, plutonium is not an essential mineral. <laughs> it is a mineral, but it is not an essential mineral. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So yes, so we want to know in terms of dietary adequacy, uh, you know, how much do we have in the food? Uh, it is a requirement on the facts level for for several of the minerals. Um, and I'm not sure what else Pam had in mind. Oh yeah, processing effects. That's a big one. So name a process that's extremely well known to reduce the mineral content of that food. Yes. Water softening. So it removes the minerals from the water. Yeah, that's correct. That is correct. Um, so another one that relates to a food that you would actually purchase would be what? So you think extrusion would get rid of the minerals? Your money, because the cost. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, any other thoughts? <clears throat> yes. Uh, maybe like milling. Milling is a the poster child for this. So, in about eighteen eighties, before you were born, um, in the Far East, they figured out how to mill what we now call brown rice into white rice, brown rice into white rice. That was a great breakthrough. Why was that such a breakthrough? Why did they bother to do it? It cost money, 
Tastes better. <laughs> Tastes better. Okay. One. What else? What else? One of the main reasons we process food. It yes. Yeah, last longer, make it easier to use. Yeah. So that was great. But one of the consequences of that was what? What's that? Correct. And in the Far East in particular, do you know there was one thing in particular that happened that was really, really bad? Anybody here ever hear of berry berry? Might have heard the word. Yeah, so beriberi is the disease. It doesn't relate to a mineral, actually. This is a thiamine, but uh, a vitamin thiamine, but it's, the concept is the same. Uh, beriberi is a thiamine deficiency disease that resulted from the milling of brown rice to white rice that probably killed a million people. And it was unheard of until they milled rice, and then it was rampant. So that's an example of a processing effect that can drastically affect the nutrition. Now, here in the wheat consuming, world we're concerned about uh, iron because iron deficiency is so common so uh, we want to know about processing effects for that reason are we doing we're removing we're something that's really important from the diet so uh, also you want to know if you're required to fortify your food and talking about white flour we are required to fortify white flour with iron we want to know are we fortifying it with to the level that we're supposed to fortify it. Is it correct? Are we adding too much, too little, or are we hitting it right on? So that's important uh, in terms of understanding that. Um, and aside about iron fortification, the re regulations require white flour to be fortified with iron. They do not require that the form of iron that you use can actually be absorbed. This is true. So they can put and do put a form of iron into the white flour that you barely absorb. And your reaction should be, what? <laughs> but it's true, they do that. So, um, and there's a reason for that. Anybody wanna guess the reason they might use a, a fairly non-absorbable form of iron? They're not doing it to be mean. Yes. Cheaper. Uh, and eh, not so much, but uh, it, it might be, but you have a thought? Okay. Uh, the answer is that uh, if it's not so well absorbed, the forms that are not so well absorbed are also very non-reactive. And so they don't oxidize the lipids that's in the food. So that's why they like to do that. It, it gets back to the stability thing. Like why would, would we mill brown rice? It's because the rice, once the, the bran is removed, is much more stable. Okay. So uh, as you all know, uh, the fax label has been changed uh, as of uh, 2016. And the uh, changes, uh, the calcium wasn't changed. It's still required to be on the fax panel and iron is still required to be on the fax panel, but we added potassium to it. So of the four uh, essential nutrients listed there, three of them are minerals and one is vitamins. So it speaks to the importance of minerals and being able to analyze that because each one of those, if it's on the facts panel, you have to analyze for it, right? So you have to know how to do that. So, so these are the minerals we're talking about. Uh, as nutritionists, we tend to break them up into categories. And uh, most commonly the three categories I have here, one is the macro minerals, just called that because you need a lot of them relative to the trace elements or micro minerals. Um, so the macro mineral, minerals are required, usually the cutoff is around like 250 milligrams per day. That would be a macro. And the trace elements are like 15 or less milligrams a day. So there's more than an order of magnitude difference between the dietary requirements for the macro minerals versus the micro minerals or the trace elements. And then the third category uh, is toxic elements. And our requirement for that is obviously negative. <laughs> We'd like to not have those in the diet. And so uh, these include arsenic, uh, cadmium, mercury, lead, aluminum, and some others. These are the most common ones. There are other ones uh, as well, but these are the ones that have 
um, garnered the most attention over the years. So here, uh, cadmium, for example, is shown uh, in batteries, and batteries do contain cadmium, so don't eat them, okay? Um, the other place you get a lot of cadmium is uh, tobacco smoke. And so people that smoke have a higher cadmium burden, and that's a problem. Uh, if, you, if you value your kidneys, trust me, that's a problem because it will damage your kidneys, so you don't want to do that. So... Uh, Lead is a huge public health issue, as you probably are aware of, uh, from uh, little kids eating lead paint. And it's not so much that they eat the paint chips. You might, have you ever heard of that? Little kids eating paint chips? Yeah, that's not really much of a thing. What happens is, though, uh, old lead paint chips and it powders and it creates a dust, and then people inhale the dust. That's really what is more of a problem. But but it's still coming from lead paint, and you guys were way too young to know the days of leaded gasoline. And maybe you didn't even know that gasoline used to contain lead, but that was actually a feature. It was a feature, not a bug, because it made the engines run better. It was a, let's call it an anti-knock agent, but it also had the unfortunate side effect of poisoning people with uh, lead. And so they finally, after a long battle with the petroleum companies, managed to get the, get the lead out of the gasoline. And it's been out for, God, I don't know, mid-60s, late 60s, something like that. So who's that? The Mad Hatter. The Mad Hatter. And where does that character come from? Uh, Alice in Wonderland. Written by, this is a literature quiz, written by... Written by, God, what are they teaching you in school these days? <laughs> or not teaching you? Four years. Oh, well, and you did a mind dump as soon as you left class. So. Exactly. Gentleman named Lewis Carroll. Lewis Carroll. Oh, you were going to say that. <laughs> no, that's someone else. <laughs> that's Charlotte's Web. <laughs> okay, the reason I'm bringing this up um, it's because it's a fun story, and also I just want to see what you guys know and don't know. And so Lewis Carroll was British, and when he was writing Alice in Wonderland, um, you're all familiar with the story, right? The White Rabbit and all that. What you may not know is that whole book was a satire on British society at the time he wrote the book. And if you were living at that time, you understood that completely, that he was making fun of you and your society. Um and so this character, compliments of the Walt Disney Company, um, shows this person called a Mad Hatter. Mad Hatters were a real thing. That was a term that existed. He did not invent that term. He just used it in his story. So who were the Mad Hatters? Well, the Hatters at that time uh, made hats out of uh, animal pelts, particularly beaver pelts that were coming from here, North America, uh, in order to preserve the pelt, to keep the pelt from basically disintegrating because of various kinds of microbiological action, they treated the pelt with something. Want to guess what that was? It was a mercury compound. And mercury is an extremely well-known neurotoxin a neurotoxin. So these people, these hatters, were suffering a um, suffering from a neurological toxin. They were suffering from le uh, mercury intoxication, and it made them go crazy. And so that's why they were called the mad hatters. So see the stuff you're learning here? Isn't that great? So that's where that comes from. OK, uh, this one, cobalt. Cobalt. That's the one that's a little unique. So yeah, last time I talked about a vitamin that contains a mineral. You guys remember which one it was? Say that again. Cobalt was in itself. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's good. B12. That's right. So B12 is a vitamin that contains cobalt. And the cobalt is the center of action for that molecule. The cobalt has to be there for it to work. Okay. We don't have a requirement 
for cobalt. But we have a requirement per se, but we have a requirement for B12, which contains cobalt. So that's why the question mark. Um, there is one class of animals, group of animals that don't require vitamin B12, but instead only require cobalt in their diet. So you can feed this group of animals cobalt and give them a vitamin B12 deficient diet and they're fine. Who is that? We have statues of them out on the mall. Cows, do you know why? <laughs> Do you guys know how cows work? Yeah. Say that again. Yeah. Ruminants, which means what? They ferment. Yeah. <laughs> so they have they have this thing called a rumen, hence the name ruminant. That's a fermentation bat, huge fermentation bat, and they have full of bacteria. So roughly, the way ruminants work is the cows eat eat the food. Then the microbes eat what the cows ate, and then the cows eat the bacteria that fed on the food that they ate. That makes sense? That's how cows work very, very crudely. And so you can just feed them cobalt because the bacteria will take that cobalt and put it into vitamin B12. They eat the bacteria and then they get their B12 that way. So they have an they can they can work either way. We can't. We have to have B12 per se. Okay. So how are we going to measure these guys in food? And so there's a number of different approaches. Just like with vitamins, we have to use a number of different approaches. It's true also with minerals, because uh, even though they're all elements, th these elements have very different characteristics, uh, as you obviously know. So uh, what technique you use depends a little bit on what you're trying to achieve and the sample form that you have. So if you want to measure a whole bunch of, uh, excuse me, a whole bunch of minerals at once, um, the most common way to do that is inductively coupled plasma spectrometry, ICP. Um, and it's usually coupled to a measurement of light and therefore it's an atomic emission spectrometer, AES, atomic emission spectrometer. So there, what's measured then is the light given off by these elements under when they're in a very, very specific condition. And that condition is when they're heated up to an extremely high temperature. That is, you have a sample here, and they're introduced um, into a stream of gas by way of a nebulizer to create a fine mist. And then that's taken up and in a special device, um, it's heated up until it's in a stage of matter we call plasma. So it's like, I think I looked up, it was like 2000 degrees Celsius, something like that. It's really, really hot. At those high temperatures, minerals, become, um, move into an excited state. And then when they drop down to the, their unexcited state, they release a photon of light. The wavelength of that light is characteristic of the mineral. So calcium will emit light in one wavelength, potassium in a different wavelength, magnesium in a different wavelength. And so you can measure the intensity of light at all these different wavelengths. And you can tell not only what's there, but by the intensity of that light, you can see how much is there. So you both identify and quantitate the number of minerals there. So that's ICP. Um, it's an expensive instrument. Uh, it's not common that a particular laboratory will have one of these piece, uh, pieces of instrument, but uh, we have one on campus over what's called the Soil Testing Laboratory. Um, and because they do this a lot for mineral analysis of soils, but they'll do biological samples that we use them as well uh, in our research for that purpose. So that's an ICP. And uh, it will determine a large number of samples or uh, minerals. Uh, the downside of ICP is the sample has to be in the liquid form. The sample has to be in a liquid form. So, um, we'll come back to that. So there's other assays. Um, you can titrate them. 
with um, uh, certain compounds that are specific for reacting with those minerals. We'll talk about an example of that. Uh, colorimetric assays, where you have compounds that bind to specific metals, and when they do so, they change color. Uh, did you guys do iron in this? No, no, uh, I, I couldn't remember. But iron, for example, will react with a compound called ferrazine, ferrazine. And when it does that, it turns a pink color. So you can quantitate the amount of iron very specifically in a mixture of other metals. It doesn't have to, you don't have to extract out the iron from the other minerals, uh, just in a mixture. And then you can use ferrazine to measure the amount of iron that is present. And then the last thing uh, is uh, ion selective electrodes. Uh, these are not used too often, uh, but they can be uh, really useful in certain circumstances. And essentially, it's like a pH electrode. You know, pH electrodes measure the hydrogen ion concentration, as everyone knows, right? So what this does is it measures not the hydrogen ion concentration, but the concentration of other ions, for example, calcium is one, potassium is another. And the way they do that is they use membranes that are specifically permeable just to those ions. Now you can imagine those membranes are really hard to make <laughs> and they're not perfect by any means. They're uh, high concentrations of other minerals will in fact interfere with that procedure. But under certain circumstances, it's really handy. This is very useful. Um, and so, uh, but again, it has to be in a liquid form to, to be able to do that. In fact, all these have to be in a liquid form. All right. So, um, so when you are doing these types of measurements, and we'll talk about these a little bit more, um, you don't generally have to ash the samples prior to the measurement. You can you still have to get it in a liquid form, but you don't have to ash it. These, as we've just talked about, uh, definitely for that one, um, you have to ash it. Now, the colorimetric assays, it depends on the matrix. Uh, in my lab class that I teach in the spring, uh, we do a colorimetric assay for iron, but it's in plasma. So it's already in the liquid form. And so we can we don't have to ash that samples. But if we were going to use it for measuring iron and liver, for example, we would need to ash it because that's a solid matrix. So uh, whether you need to go to the extreme of ashing your samples or not depends on the approach that you're using. So uh, which then brings us to the question of sample preparation. And I will tell you from my years of experience measuring minerals is that this is the hardest part. The sample preparation is the trickiest, trickiest part to measuring the minerals. The actual measurement is in almost all cases, not very complicated, okay? But the sample preparation is. So what sort of things does one have to be concerned with when you're trying to prepare a sample for mineral analysis. Anybody want to guess? Yes. Uh, make sure it's a characteristic sample. You yeah, always. <laughs> Minerals, vitamins, whatever it is, right? You want to make sure your sampling is uh, characteristic and doesn't, um, either from taking too small a sample when you have a, a, a heterogeneous sample, or whether if you're sampling different runs that it's it's the right one that you want to analyze. So that's that's a good answer. Other things you might want to be concerned with in sample preparation in, for mineral analysis. Yes? I mean, you kind of said what it was like, whether or not the method you're using is ashing before. Right. You have to figure out, does this need to be ashed or not? That's uh, very critical. If it's solid, almost certainly. <laughs> That's, that's pretty much, but even if it's not, sometimes it does. Yes? Um, if you're extracting the minerals, if there's other things to be extracted that interfere with the analysis? Right, interfering substances. That's right. And there is um, um, 
uh, some classical examples of that known. And usually there's ways around this if you know it, uh, interfering substances. A common one is if you are measuring calcium by something kind of like it, um, inductively coupled plasma spectrometry, uh, but uh, this is called atomic absorption spectrophotometry. Have, have you heard of atomic absorption? Yeah. So if you're trying to measure calcium, uh, phosphorus will interfere. Uh, and that's well known, but there's an easy way around it. You add a bunch of lanthanum to the sample and that suppresses the phosphorus from becoming, um, ex um, I'll, I'll say excited, uh, it's not quite right, but close enough, uh, excited state. So, so you wanna know the nature of your sample so that you can account for those. So um, a big one, and this is more true for the trace elements than it is for the macro minerals, but it's contamination, contamination. And this was drilled into me because when I started graduate school in nutrition, I started uh, work in a trace element laboratory. We were studying how trace element deficient diets affected reproduction uh, using rats. And so we had to make diets that were very, very low in a particular mineral. And then when we analyzed things, we had to use very, very clean technique. So uh, that is something you always have to be aware of. So clean technique, uh, and again, it depends on the mineral, how fastidious you have to be, but clean technique is always an issue. So for example, when I was working um, in trace elements for my master's degree, all the anything that was going to come in contact with the sample had to be washed in 20% nitric acid. So um, that's fairly concentrated. <clears throat> and if you get 20% 20, 20 nitric acid on your skin, um, it burns. It's not going to cause like a hole in your finger or anything like that, but it burns and it leaves a yellow mark on your skin. And all of us who worked in the lab, we all had yellow marks all over our fingers all the time <laughs> from, from this 20% nitric acid washing. Um, but that's what you had to do to get good results, to keep things clean. So it's a real important thing. And of course, you always run a blank to see if you have contamination. And um, given that your samples sometimes have to go through multiple steps, there are multiple opportunities for contamination to occur. So running a blank, running a sample through the entire process is really critical when you're doing mineral analysis. Okay, <clears throat> so th there's a lot more to it, but those are a couple of key factors, uh, the, the main one being contamination. Uh, lots of interferences, we talked about one already. Um, uh, so um, the trick for mineral analysis for a lot of the techniques is that you're going to have, a, uh, in most cases, a set of standards, just like you do for other kinds of measurements, right? And so for many of these measurements, the way you get the best results is you take your standards and you put them in the same kind of matrix as your samples. So um, if you're... Uh, I have to come back to biological samples because those are the ones I know best, is if you're measuring plasma, then you want to create try and create a matrix that's very similar to plasma. Plasma has a lot of protein in it, for example, so you, you could add protein to it, you could add salts to it to, to match the osmotic level in the plasma. And you do all these things to try and match the matrix. So I don't know if you got that, match the matrix. <laughs> So uh, that's really important. Uh, pH can be important for some, some procedures. Um, reagents, a lot of times you won't necessarily do what's called a dry ashing, which is where you put your sample in a crucible, put it in a muffle furnace, ash it, that's dry ashing. But there's also something called wet ashing, where you digest it in a concentrated acid. Well, acids, can be quite contaminated with metals. So they actually sell 
metal free concentrated acids like nitric acid, sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid. And they are certified to be free of uh, extraneous metals. They cost like, you know, five times as much. <laughs> but your samples are valuable and your time is valuable. So it's very common that people will pay the money to get these acids for doing wet ashing uh, of samples in order to ensure that there's no contamination. So um, that's, that's a key point. So uh, what you have to do, again, will depend both on the sample, the mineral you're gonna analyze and the technique you're going to use. So uh, it's hard to give really broad recommendations because of that, but be aware that they are there you're going to be doing mineral analysis you've got to do your research you've got to look into that particular technique that particular mineral that you're looking at to see what the peculiarities are for measuring that make sense believe that you're great okay um i don't think you guys did this right uh um so this was just an example uh, that Pam came up for demonstrating the, a titration method for a mineral. And it uses a um, indicator called uh, Kalmagite. Uh, Kalma I think that's how it's pronounced. I, I've not used this myself, but um, the idea is that um, EDTA, which is a chelator, you're probably familiar with EDTA, it binds metals, um, some uh, with great affinity, some not so much, but it binds uh, calcium, for example, really, really well. And so um, you can add EDTA to a solution of a sample of interest. It will bind all that calcium uh, that's there. And then you can, uh, excuse me, you add the dye first. You add the dye and that binds all the mineral. And then you titrate with the EDTA and the EDTA will bind the calcium better than the indicator the Kalmagite indicator. So when you get to the point where you've pulled all of the calcium off the calmagdite, it will change color. And then at that point, uh, you stop the titration and you can then calculate how much was there. So the theory is that the indicator has less affinity for the EDTA. You take advantage of that fact. And that when the uh, calma, uh, uh, all the uh, calcium in this case uh, is removed from that indicator, then it changes color, okay? So that's a titration for a mineral. Uh, another example of a titration, uh, this one is called a Moore um, titration, I assume after someone named Moore. <laughs> I didn't actually look it up, but I, I believe that is the person. So in this case, um, the idea is to measure the amount of, of chloride, chloride. And so what you first do is you add uh, uh, silver until um, uh, in, in excess until you make sure that all the uh, chloride is bound to the silver to create silver chloride. And then at that point, uh, you can add um, chromate, which will bind to the any excess silver and it turns this orange color. And that is when you know that you have uh, achieved the uh, full binding. And you can then, through some complicated calculations, you can calculate how much chloride was there. Uh, I don't believe it's done very often anymore, uh, but that was one that's available uh, in the past. So uh, this one, yeah, she likes titrations. <laughs> You know how many titrations I've done in my life? Like one. <laughs> that was for a class. Um, so this one again um, involves forming uh, silver chloride and then you combine uh, the silver chlor chloride with thiocyanate, thiocyanate to form south, uh, a silver thiocyanate. And uh, again, when you are, um, Measuring iron, I think this is for, no, this is um, using the iron as the indicator, the ferric iron. So any excess biocyanate uh, is then um, determined by the amount of ferric iron ion you add 
And at that point, when you add it uh, and there's excess, it will precipitate. And then you can measure the precipitate. So again, um, these are not going to be as precise as, for example, using atomic absorption spectrophotometry. But if you're measuring a food, for example, that has a lot of chloride ion in it, you don't need it to be that precise. And this will uh, uh, very possibly be quicker and easier to do than uh, something like atomic absorption. So it's used for that way. Uh, there are uh, quicker and easier ways to measure chloride specifically, and I think perhaps a few other minerals. Uh, and that is, they have now come up with basically dipsticks. So that's handy. And one that's on the market is called Quantab. Um, so that's for measuring chloride. And it uses the principles that are involved in this more titration to do that. Uh, of course, the reason you use these kinds of things is because they're fast. And this one is AOAC approved method. Um, and it'll get you within plus or minus 10%, which is sufficiently accurate for uh, uh, most food applications. And it does not have a very, um, uh, it has a pretty wide range. So if you're measuring chloride, uh, which uh, you know primarily you'd want to do that as a measure of, of, of uh, sodium chloride added to the food or that's already present, you can do that. So the higher this goes up, the more chloride there is. And so they have both for a low range and a high range. I don't think you could read that. But so if you think the chloride level is going to be low, you'd use one dipstick. If you think it's going to be high, you'd use the other one. Okay. And so between one of those, you're going to be able to get on scale to measure the chloride. So this is something that's, that's quick and easy, reasonably accurate, and it's accepted method for measuring a mineral chloride. Um, Again, this would be uh, very useful in the food industry, but not so much in biological systems. Okay, so, um, so it's important for you folks to remember methods for measuring minerals. There's a number of them and they have different utilities. So the titration methods are not going to be particularly useful for the trace elements. They're not sensitive enough but they're very good for the macro minerals, for example. Uh, ICP is good for measuring a whole lot of minerals. And I mean, literally like 25, many more than the trace elements that are required. And they're, they're gonna measure things that you could care less about. So you may not wanna do that because of the time and the expense uh, for doing that kind of thing. And then there's these titration methods, for example, that are fairly easy once they're set up, you know, the solutions made. So there's a lot of different ones. So. Sample preparation, what was the most important thing I talked about for sample preparation? Contamination, that's exactly right. And I'm speaking from experience because I've contaminated a number of things over my years. So I, I, I know how easy this is to do. And so now, why do you think you'd want to analyze minerals? Processing effects. I think that's, that's a huge one in the food industry is to understand processing effects. And the second, probably most important reason is, say that again louder. Labeling. Yes, labeling, regulations. It's always about the regulations. Got to meet the regulations. So um, I don't even know the answer to that one um, for sure. <laughs> I don't know what it is. So, so I'm not going to worry about that. Okay, um, so that was titration. Um, colorimetric methods are commonly used as well. And so uh, I mentioned one of these, which is to use uh, this compound called uh, ferrazine, or it's an organic compound that binds uh, iron specifically and then will change color. So uh, when they uh, when you use these things, they normally follow uh, the standard laws, uh, Beer's law for thing, compounds that absorb. So in some cases, you can use the molar extinction coefficient, although it's more com common for people to generate a standard curve and do that. Um, and this 
shows an example of a standard curve where they were measuring phosphorus using a reagent called molybdovanidate. And molybdovanidate reacts with phosphorus and it changes color. So that works really well because you can see very clearly the color change there. <clears throat> yes, sir. So chromogen is like a class of compounds, not just like one thing. Absolutely correct. Chromogen is a word that applies to any to the color compound. So it can be any color compound that forms after a reaction. So it's a it's an extremely broad term. Chromo means color. And uh, so chromogen just means colored compound, okay? So, so why did I show this? You guys wondering? No, had no idea, didn't care. <laughs> so I have experience with this reaction. <clears throat> I think we have a couple of minutes I could tell this story. So everyone loves the story, right? So when I was in graduate school, I was doing this uh, a variation on this reaction to measure phosphorus. We were doing it for the purpose of trying to quantitate phospholipids, phospholipids. And you do that by measuring the phosphorus. That's a way to do it. So I was doing this and uh, successfully, and then another person in the lab wanted to do it. So I was taught him how to do it. I said, this is what you've got to do. You've got to do this and this and this. And I said, and by the way, because these phospholipids are really sticky, to get the glassware clean, just washing with detergent is sometimes not good enough. Plus those detergents can be contaminated with phosphates, right? We know about the problem of phosphates and detergents, right? So I said, the thing to do is to wash them, rinse them, and then soak them in 20% nitric acid because we had that around because of the trace element work. And so uh, he said, yeah, yeah, okay, I got that, I got that. And so we did this assay, and part of the assay is that you have to heat the tubes in an oven. So he, he had a whole rack of test tubes. He'd run the reaction. He carried it over to the other lab where the oven is. He, it was like an oven down here. He opened the door. He put it in there. He closed it and set the temperature and walked away. About 10 minutes later, there's a huge explosion. It was so powerful, it blew the door down, even though it was lashed. It blew the door down. What the hell happened? Oh my God. So we, you know, everyone freaked out. The people in the, this lab, wasn't even our lab. We were going to another lab. They were really, really freaked out. So I went down there. I pulled out the rack and there was like one, where one tube used to be, it was just gone. There was nothing. And then there was a shatter ring coming out from that one tube. So I said, okay, that tube blew up. <laughs> Why did it blow up? And I had to think about it for a while. I couldn't figure it out. Why did that tube blow up? And then it finally started coming to me. I said, okay, it was something explosive, right? And there was phosphorus there because we were measuring that, right? The assay, you add sulfuric acid to the assay. That's part of the assay. Turns out that's two of the three ingredients in nitroglycerin, nitroglycerin. And the third one is nitric acid. So what happened was my friend synthesized nitroglycerin and nitroglycerin is incredibly unstable, unbelievably unstable. And so it detonated in that oven and blew up in that one tube because he didn't rinse the tube well enough and did not get enough, get all the nitric acid out of it. So we had nitric acid, we had sulfuric acid and we had phosphate from the phospholipids and boom. So, great story, huh? <laughs> so uh, I'd say let that be a lesson to you, but I can't imagine the circumstances where this would ever happen to you guys. So anyway, uh, so it's a variation on this assay, but a bad one. <laughs> okay, so ion selective electrodes, I have what, five minutes left? Yeah, yeah, okay. So ion selective electrodes. Uh, I have a little bit of experience with these. Um, they're they're expensive and they're touchy. Uh, they get um, uh, the membranes get plugged, get contaminated, you know, plugged up uh, easily. But when they work, they're great. And uh, they're usually 
used for, as far as I know, they're always used for macro minerals. You wouldn't measure iron, you wouldn't measure zinc, you wouldn't measure copper with these, they're not sensitive enough. But if you wanted to use calcium, which is what we were doing, uh, they, they work. So you can use them with a standard pH meter. You don't have to get a fancy pH meter, just a standard one that has the ability to do this, and a lot of them do. And so it's just measuring an electric uh, potential like any pH measurement does. But the, again, the trick is the membranes are ion selective. And that's the whole key. And why they're expensive is because those are hard to manufacture, is that you uh, have an ion selective electrode. Now, again, uh, if you have really high concentrations of other ions, it can, in fact, interfere. But you can compensate to that, at least to some extent, by, again, matching the matrix, matching the matrix. And so uh, generally what you do is you create a standard curve. When we did this, we were measuring calcium. And so we had a standard curve of calciums, and we would measure the voltage of those standards, and then we measured the samples, and it seemed to work really well. So uh, this is something, obviously, this is very fast. If your sample is already in a liquid form, you essentially have to do nothing. You just drop in the electrodes and you can take a measurement. So it can be really fast if you have the right kind of sample. Okay. Um, again, uh, uh, interfering ions, you have to be careful about that. Um, you want to match the matrix by keeping the ion straight, uh, strength similar. Uh, it does have a pretty broad range. So that's nice. You can get many orders of magnitude of range can't do that for a lot of things. Um, if you concentrations are low, and I can attest to this in the thing you're measuring, um, it's giving a weak signal. That is the voltage will be low and you'll get a lot of noise. And so if the concentrations of the ion of interest are low, it's not possibly, it might not be the best approach to do. Okay. Um, I, these are used, uh, for example, calcium uh, in milk is a use of this. Um, Salt, nitrate, and processed meat, but you'd have to get the meat into a liquid form because, again, that's the only way they work. Um, and again, like for wine, if you want to measure potassium and sodium, most likely you just literally drop it in the wine and it works really well for that. Okay, so uh, Pam has this calculation for you. Uh, it's too long to read here. So what I uh, would suggest that you read this and think about it uh, she actually gives the answers on the next slide. So you'll have this slide deck. Uh, I would strongly suggest you read it over and then try to understand the calculation, how she came up with the answers that she did on that. So uh, with that, um, I'll end and I'll take any questions that you might have on this. And yes, sir. At the time of contamination, I'm mostly concerned with contamination of other min like minerals not of interest or is it just like adding minerals of like that you're targeting like how could you know what I'm saying? Are we adding minerals to it that we're measuring and therefore we get like over underestimation or are we other uh in most cases what you're worried about is contamination with the metal of interest. In my case, um I was working with when I was doing my master's work on this uh, zinc was, uh, I was trying to measure zinc. Zinc's the absolute worst, absolute worst thing you can work with. It's everywhere. It's in the dust. It accumulates in the dust in the beakers. And so we literally would acid wash our beakers, dry them upside down, and then cover them with saran wrap and keep them covered until we were ready to use it because of the zinc, because we were trying to measure zinc. So almost always the contamination is contamination with what you're trying to measure, not with other things. Okay. Good question, though. Anything else? Yes. Uh, some forms of reduced iron. It's just called reduced iron. If you look on your label, uh, it'll say reduced iron, which doesn't help that much because there's actually a lot of forms of reduced iron, and some are available and some are not. And so it's it's kind of tricky. Uh, there's another one that's used in the food industry um, uh, called... Um, just called EDTA iron. And the advantage of that one is that it doesn't interfere, it doesn't promote oxidation of the food, but it's not as absorbable as something like ferrous sulfate. 
ferrous sulfate uh, uh, for human consumption is probably the most absorbable form of iron. It's also the form that's most going to promote lipid oxidation. And so they've tried to find that balance between something that won't call us the food to go rancid, but yet is at least somewhat absorbable. Does that make sense? Okay. And iron oxide, we have another name for that. Rust <laughs> is not very absorbable. So different things. All right. Other questions? All right. Well, thanks a lot. It's been great. And uh, well, uh, enjoy the rest of the class. I guess Pam will be back on um, Friday. Okay. Yeah, I like what